Captain, we have them. We've established Transporter Lock, the Star Trek Discovery podcast. Join Ken and Sabriel each week as they explore strange new episodes, seek out new plots and new characters, and boldly go where no podcast has gone before. Hello and welcome to the Transporter Lock Podcast for Season 1, Episode 4, The Butcher's Knife Cares Not for the Lamb's Cry. I'm your co-host, Ken Gagney, and joining me today is... Sabriel! Hi, Sabriel, how are you? I am doing wonderful, Ken, thank you for asking. It's Monday, the day after, uh, uh, well, I'm going to say Monday, the day after Sunday, but no, the day after uh, Sundays are now exciting to me because we get a new episodes of Star Trek, at least here in the U.S., it's true. I haven't watched a TV show as it airs regularly, weekly, in about 20 years, so it's new for me to have this on my calendar. Like, nope, every Sunday night, I'm busy. You and me, too. Uh, you and me both. Like, years ago, you know, every Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Star Trek. I think even when Enterprise was on, or even Voyager, I think those shows, well, especially Voyager was on while I was in college, so my dad would tape it, and then I'd watch it when I went home on the weekend. So even that was a regular routine, but we had some flexibility. With CBS All Access, we have that same flexibility because it's on demand, stream whenever you want. But no, I want to be one of the first people to watch it so that Twitter doesn't spoil it for me. Exactly. Oh, and if you are watching it on CBS All Access, they've been posting the shows about 15 minutes earlier, so the last two times. <sighs> Spoiler! Keep that in mind. And it sounds like we have a few more episodes to look forward to than we originally anticipated. Yeah, so... Word on the street originally, we were only going to get five episodes, and suddenly we're getting eight, and now we're getting nine episodes before we take the season break. Right, so the overall season, I believe, is still 15 episodes, but instead of having eight and then seven, it's going to be nine and then six. Yeah. So the show is going to air through mid-November, and then it'll pause until, I think, January? Yeah, sometime in January. I don't remember the exact date yet. And it's been a while since I've watched primetime TV, but this actually reminds me of the olden days, like back in the 80s and 90s. It seems like shows would start in September, run until the holidays, then resume after the holidays and run until about May or so. Yep, that's pretty much how TV works these days. I, mean, has, I think it has been for quite a while. Why does television follow a primary school schedule? I think of uh, following the families on holidays. People don't watch TV as much. I suppose. And then summertime, no one's at home. For us child-free individuals, who gives a crap? <laughs> oh, also, some other news I wanted to mention was that New York Comic Con just happened. Yeah, I actually, other than uh, something Jason Isaac said, I intentionally, intentionally avoided hearing much, just in case there was some kind of spoilers. And it is exactly what Jason Isaac said that I think is worthy of a mention on this show. <laughs> So I believe, I don't know if there was a troll in the audience or just somebody in the audience asking him about trolls. Regardless, the sentiment came up that some people disapprove of Discovery because of who the lead character is, who the lead actor is. And Jason Isaac said, for those who don't like Discovery because it is a black person and a woman in the lead role, they can go f themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I retweeted that and <laughs> this <is> my captain... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he is such a jerk on the show, and it's nice to know that he has some of that same brass off the air as well. Oh, yeah, he's been he's been uh, kind of showing his, like, yeah, you can just shove off if you have problems with this, and it's great. Not not the, he doesn't say that about the, like, if you have problems with the quality of the show, just if you have problems with these, like, issues around the show, go, go, we don't want you. Right, if that is your issue, then we're not having it. Also, another exciting announcement, not only are we getting more episodes of Discovery, we also are getting a new website for Transporter Lock, which just launched last week. Yeah, it's a pretty cool little place. It has uh, links to all our feeds and bios, and you can see awesome art by Allison Holt. That's right. If you haven't already seen our album artwork, it is gracing the banner of our website. And as well as Bree mentioned, there are links to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Overcast, TuneIn, Mixcloud, Acast, RSS, and email. Pretty much anywhere you can download a thing, you can download a thing. Right, and all the links that you were using previously f to find this show are still working. Nothing has changed in that respect. We were previously hosted temporarily on another website, but courtesy of the magic of redirects, just keep going to transporterlock.com, and there's all the episodes and bios for the co-hosts. 
Of course, the website is in service to the podcast, so let's get on with this week's podcast discussing the latest episode. It was a rather lengthy title, as I mentioned, something about, I don't know, going to the butcher and grabbing a scimitar and carving up a sheep or something, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> there were really two main tracks for the plots, and rather than going in the same order they were presented, we thought it would be more cohesive and easier to comprehend if we followed each storyline separately, since they didn't interact in this episode. Yeah, no, they are entirely separate events, so this works perfectly. Right, so which one do you want to start with? Let's start with the Klingons. Okay, start us with the Klingons, Bree. All right, in the opening of the show, we have Voke telling us, or monologuing to himself, uh, that his holy ship has been stranded at the Binary Stars for six months, and they're low on supplies. Which really surprised me, because I know the 24 houses are not really united, except in this new war against the Federation, but the idea that these 24 ships would arrive when Kalos's beacon was lit, and then leave and abandon the ship that called them there in the first place, to Kuvma's ship, whose neck was exploded through the photon torpedo, that's just been still there at the Binary Star for all this time. Yeah, and no one has come back to check on them? Like, they were instrumental on all this? Like, that's, it feels a little weird, and maybe there is a good reason. I mean, it is an ancient ship, but it seems to be able to hold its own. And it has, well, we'll get to that in a minute, something very powerful on it. And not only have the Klingons been ignoring this battleship, but also the Federation. Like, they never thought to go back to where the war started and say, oh, hey, the leader of this war is sitting here helpless. Maybe we should finish the job. Yeah, that does feel a little weird. And maybe it'll be answered later, but I feel like I'm starting to say that a little bit too much about the show. And there is something that pops up later in the show that makes you wonder, did Starfleet go back? I'll bring that up later, too. In the meantime, Voke is stranded there trying to figure out what to do, and he has salvaged all the other birds of prey that were left at the battle site, and nothing has anything that they can use to power their battleship or to feed their crew, whose rations are running out. Yeah, and then we are introduced to Laurel. Ah, oh, thank you. I forgot her name. Yeah. She comes up and is like, are you an artist? Because he's looking at this huge sensor like display, and he's drawing out all the patterns of all the debris in the area. She has a little one-on-one -on -one with him, and it's clear that these two have the Klingon hots for each other, but they're shy to say it. It stood out to me more in the second watching. Yeah, she is encouraging him at first to modify his standards and accept that the remains of the USS Shenzhou is the only derelict in this battlefield that might have the equipment they need. Yeah, and... He is anti-doing this because this is the ship that killed Takuvma. She's like, no, don't worry about it. Let's just, just do it. We gotta do what we gotta do to stay alive. Well, the whole reason they started this war is to avoid, quote-unquote, assimilation, interesting word choice, by the Federation. And then here they are accepting the Federation's technology in order to power their ship. So okay, I can thank see... thank you. Yeah. Somehow I could not... I did not piece, like, why? Why? Just do what you gotta do. Like, no, that was my human ideals apparently coming through. Like, it didn't even occur to me. Yeah, they don't want anything to do with the Federation, whether it's their culture, their Starfleet, their Federation, or their technology. But apparently she talks them into it. At some point during this conversation they're having, she mentions she's from House Mokai. This is the Watcher clan, the Deceivers, the Weavers of Lies. And I think that's going to play into the future, because it does not in this episode. She does engage in some mild deception later, but we'll get to that. But before they go get the equipment, they get a visitor. Yes, Cole, a Klingon that we met in the first episode, or was that second episode, where he was kind of like, uh, this whole reuniting crap's not going to work. I'm out of here. He comes and apologizes for not helping. Yeah, he's singing a very different tune. Finally, a potential savior arrives and kneels before Voke and says, your ship is amazing with its cloaking technology. We would love to share it with you in this mighty war. Yeah, and Voke is all like, or whatever belonged to the house of Takuvma belongs to the house of Cole. And this is when I started to lose respect for Voke because he was so obviously being played and he couldn't see through it. He is not made for leadership. He does not have experience and he did not see this coming. No, he is not astute, as you might say. <laughs> That's what they were saying. Right. <laughs> that he was saying about uh, Lorel later. So the two of them, Voke the albino, uh, Takuvma's second in command, and Lorel, his newfound potential lover, certainly an ally, beam more to the Shenzhou. Yes, and he beams up onto the bridge, which is an interesting shot, because it's the same shot that we saw in the beginning of the series with 
The camera pans around the ship and zooms in on Burnham standing there on the bridge. This time we got camera zooms in, pans in on Revoke standing on the bridge and upside down. It's the exact same shot. Right, because gravity and atmosphere are completely gone, but somehow they're able to restore atmosphere to the captain's quarters. Yeah, they had some, they were carrying some device for atmosphere. I think it was just so we could see the Klingons and not have them talk through super space Klingon suits. And speaking of which, let me go on a brief tangent here. There is a lot of Klingonese being spoken in this show. In fact, it's uh-huh. the very first scene of the entire series, if you want to go back a few episodes. So there's a lot of subtitles. The subtitles are in all caps. Looks like they're, they're always shouting. I, you know, I didn't realize I was signing up to watch a foreign film. <laughs> so there's been some talk about this. People are like, okay, we kind of get it. Let's just do some English. And others, others are like, no, this is how they would be talking. Let's actually see this instead of English. And the people who see this for speaking all in Klingonese is it kind of hides the prosthetics of talking in English because you can tell that they are starting to learn how to speak through the prosthetics now in a few episodes in. And I think at least it doesn't stand out as much when they speak Klingonese. Are you saying that the prosthetics affect their ability to speak English? Not in a way that doesn't sound weird to us because listen to Cork first season or any Klingons who are Klingons of the week. You can hear it. I mean, I agree that when... Takuvmo spoke in English and said, we come in peace. That was an awesome moment uh-huh. because it had the context of the Klingonese. That worked well. We haven't heard the Klingon speak English at all in this episode. No, we don't. I mean, this is, that was me standing outside the Star Trek universe and into the real world. I think the best example I ever saw of somebody who is speaking a foreign language, but it comes out as English for the benefit of the audience, was best done in the 1961 Spencer Tracy film, Judgment at Nuremberg, where one of the Nazis is speaking German, and the camera sort of zooms in on him, and all of a sudden he's speaking English. And we know that is just an affectation for the audience's benefit. We don't think that there's a universal translator. We don't think the German switch languages. I wish they could come up with some sort of similar effect for Star Trek Discovery, because... I agree they are getting better at speaking Klingon, but I'm getting a little bored with it. I can see that. Plus, sometimes they speak quickly enough where it can be difficult to keep track of what they're saying in the subtitles. Or even if you don't keep track, it's easy to, like, you're trying to focus on the conversation and you look up at their eyes the, and, you know, their, their mannerisms. And then you're like, oh, shoot, I got to look back down to see what they're saying. It's true. Klingon does seem to be a fairly compact language. They can say a few words that take us many words to read. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. However, correlating with the release of Star Trek Discovery, the mobile app Duolingo released a Klingon language pack. <laughs> I keep forgetting to check that out. Yeah, I thought it was just a rumor. I even downloaded the app, but I never got around to logging into it. But I just double-checked. I just did a quick Google search for Duolingo Klingon, and it brings me right to their official page, which verifies that this is indeed a thing. Well, I think I know what I'm doing this afternoon. Just five minutes a day, and you can learn a foreign tongue. <laughs> you might need the prosthetics, though. Those aren't included. Yes. <laughs> so. Go get some va- a vampire teeth. It's Halloween when we record this. Uh, p- perfect. A vampire Klingon. I love it. <laughs> That's a thing now. Do it. <laughs> so they're on the Shenzhou. Is this when, as you know, I have a tendency to skip around scenes. Is this when they go down to engineering? Well, first it starts out with Cole in the ready, ready room. He's looking around. And there's not much going on here, but there is one thing I noticed right away. You mean Voke? Excuse me, Voke, yeah. Okay. Uh, Voke is in the ready room. And there's debris flying around or whatever. There's one thing I noticed in the background that's missing. I don't know if I should mention it now or the end. Oh, I hadn't. That's very astute. I hadn't noticed that. Let's save that till the end. All right. So, 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 if, if viewers or listeners might be catching on, like I pay attention to these things in the background as much as I can. It's kind of a curse in a lot of TV shows, and uh, like you'll see extras walking by the same scene in different directions every cut or weird things like that. I'll notice these little things, and it's useful for shows where they actually are clever about the background. Do you notice these things on the first time watching the episode or the second? Typically, yes, the first time. Oh, the first time. Okay, got uh-huh. it. Because due to our viewing schedule and our different work schedules, I tend to watch each episode of Discovery only once before coming on the podcast. You have the benefit of watching it twice. Yeah. And the second time, I do focus more on the background, but a lot of of major things I will catch on the first one, too, because that's just my thing. 
And one of the reasons we're sort of avoiding spoilers, even though this is a spoiler cast, is because we actually have, I know, at least one listener who is wa- listening to our podcast without watching the TV show. He does not have CBS All Access, so he's living vicariously through our show. Yeah, it's, that's quite an incredible thing. I'm happy to help out there. <laughs> yeah, so thank you to everybody who's listening regardless. And we have this you know, structure that we're walking through the episode that... As, as opposed to us just coming on the show and opening with saying, so what did you think of the episode? Mm-hmm. This gives us a little bit of a framework in which to make sure we don't miss anything and to share the episode with our viewers. So anyway, uh, brief tangent there. So they're in the ready room. They see some data pads floating around. Uh, I think this is when they get a brief profile of the captain and her first officer. Yep, yep. It's very brief. Uh, he, he doesn't seem to be able to understand it. He just sees their faces and like, ah. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't care. So then he yeah. and Laurel go down to engineering. Yeah, and they have that tender moment again. <laughs> yeah, they are very gingerly disassembling the warp core to remove the one piece that they need with the full awareness that it could explode in their faces. And said they're just very gently talking about, so, uh, Laurel, I'm surprised that you follow me because... I know Takuma anointed me and all, but you must have doubted his choice, and as you know, I'm not very astute. <laughs> but you are. He's astute enough to know he's not astute. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, I'll be your defender, your champion, and whatnot. And then she, as she says, like, I'll be your defender, he's like staring at her into her eyes, and she reaches down to the device that they're using, and starting to kind of go, to have this little high-pitched thing, like something's about to go wrong, and he sits there and just clicks it. It's very kind of phallic as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Bree, where is your mind? Uh, seeing that these two have a huge thing for each other and watching the second viewing, I caught that more than the first one. Well, you know what I definitely caught the first time? Just when I thought that this metaphor between the two of them was reaching a fever pitch, she says, shall we uncouple? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. whoa, I thought she was going to go just the opposite and say, shall we couple? <laughs> yeah, she was talking about the device that she just turned off. Right. But she turned on another, another one. Uh, huh. Right, so they pulled out the thing they needed. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> I'm being dirty. Oh. In a cheeky way. Grow up, Bree. <laughs> Honestly. So they get the thing, and they bring it back to... The, what is the name of Takuma's ship? Does it we have a name? We don't have a name for it yet. It's basically a holy ship. Okay. And they even talk about how it's an old ship. Sure. So they bring it back to the holy ship, and Kor, in Voke's absence, has fed the crew of the holy ship. Yeah, he came here and brought, he basically bought their loyalty with food. Hey, it works for me. The quickest way to a Klingon's double hearts is through his double stomachs. <laughs> so Volk is very surprised by this. We as viewers are not because Volk is a weak leader and anybody who's going to offer the Klingons strong leadership, I think they're going to fall behind. Oh, absolutely. Cole comes back and he says like, yeah, their, their loyalty is cheap. I just give them food. And he tells Volk, like, basically, you're an idiot. Once this war is over, the houses are going to divide again. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. I really thought that Takuma's mission was to unite the houses, and I wasn't thinking about, is that what we see in the next generation or even the original series? And it really isn't. So this war, I I don't know what the point of it is. I thought the point was to unite the houses, and here's Kor admitting that's not going to happen, but we're going to fight the war anyway. So I guess they agree with the mission of fighting back the Federation and not joining them, but only in the short term. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that Cole is very short-sighted. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's silly of him to believe that you can defeat the Federation once and for all without an ongoing unifying force to resist them. However, it, was, it is more of a we got to talk. We got to mention something about Cole here before we close up on the Klingon thing. Yeah, I may have been accidentally referring to him as Kor, but if his name is Cole, then just go back and do a find replace dear viewer, and that's what I meant. <laughs> So what do we have to say about this person? Cole is, mentions that he's part of the House of Kor. And in Deep Space Nine, this is referenced in that the House of Kor does not take miscreants or outcasts. They basically, you have to be a noble. They're very elitist. That's what I'm looking for. And this shows in his edit with, this shows in Cole's attitude towards Voke. The whole holy ship was manned by misfits and miscreants, including Volk, who is son of none, house of none. So you're saying this is why Cole dismissed him so easily, because it is in his house's lineage to do so? Yes. Hmm. He, he thinks nothing of these people. And that's why he left them in the first place. He ignored them. He comes back here just to steal their tech and steal the girl. 
so he thinks. Yeah, he just he just treats these people like they're nothing. So it's a consistent house culture across over a hundred years. Yes. Very cool. I was not aware of that detail. I couldn't remember the exact significance of core in this regard until I looked it up, but yeah. All right, let's start wrapping up the Klingon stuff because we want to get to the other half of the show. Right, we got a lot of show to talk about still. Lorel, she turns on Voke, basically says, I'm with you, Cole. Let's go do our thing. And Cole's like, let's go kill Voke. And she's like, no, put him in the graveyard of our enemies. It's more fitting that way. Right, so they abandon Voke back on the Shenzhou, back in Captain Georgiou's ready room, where he is now trapped as he watches his own holy ship warp out without him. Except, at the very last second, he gets a visitor. Yeah, Lorel beams in behind him, and he thought she had turned on him, but she's like, no, 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 it's cool, whatever. But, um, but she, and he's sitting here feeling like he's lost everything. He's lost his ship, he's lost his people, and she, he's down in, in the dumps, and she's like, no, this is better for the grand scheme of things. I'm going to, we got to think, we have to think bigger. And I'm going to leave you with the matriarchs of Mukai, her house. But it will require a sacrifice of everything. Yeah, she said, we're going, they'll expose you to things you never knew possible, but at a cost. Right, whatever that may be. And uh, we assume he agrees, because he's sort of between a rock and a hard place. He's got nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the food processors are going to work on the Shenzhou. Right. <laughs> this was also the first time we have seen the Klingons from the first two episodes six months later. Yeah, yeah. They were not in the previous episodes, uh, season one, episode three, and now they're finally back and we get to find out what they're doing. So if that theory we had, which was that the third episode was supposed to be the first, if that was true, then this episode would have been the first time we ever saw Voke. And I think we would have lacked significant context. So Yeah, you're right. If they did go back and shoot prequel episodes, which became the Vulcan Hello and Battle of the Binary Stars, they must have done some major editing to this episode because it would no way make sense on its own. Editing? Or maybe those episodes were supposed to be between the first and fourth? I Who knows? Or the first and... Yeah. Anyway. We, never, we may never know. So it's interesting to see where the Klingons are going from now. I assume it's going to follow Voke although we might not see him for a while because he has a lot of learning to do, and I can't imagine that makes for good television. Right, right. Unless we get to see some kind of transformation. There are hypotheses if you want to hear them. Let's hear them. Some people think that the sacrifices are going to be... I, I honestly don't think about, I don't think this is going to happen, but I think this is going to be where we start seeing uh, forehead ridgeless Klingons in Discovery. Like he has to sacrifice his body. Like, I don't think this is... I don't think that holds up, though. You think he's going to subject himself to the augment virus? Yeah, I mean that's what that's what the hypotheses are. I don't hold with that. Uh, the augment virus, as detailed in the TV show Enterprise, now predates Discovery by about ninety years. I don't think uh -huh. at this point they would willingly subject them themselves to it. Yeah, it feels a little odd unless he's going to go undercover in the Star in Starfleet or something. And now, oh, and then maybe that's why the triple on the desk is going to be important. Which is why we continue to hear the triple cooing on Captain Lorca's desk. Maybe it's not so so out there, but ah, uh, we'll see. I mean, there's no there, there's no way that Captain Lorca could know that that is a possibility. Yeah. But so I think it's low possi low probability, but not impossible. Any other theories? That's the big one. The other half of this episode did take place on Discovery. We start off with Burnham in her quarters. She is getting a new Starfleet uniform oh replicated. The episode opens with a really cool scene. It looks like this massive storm on this weird planet. And then it zooms out, zooms out, and zooms out. And like, oh, it's just the, synth or the sequencer, the synthesizer. Yeah, it was like a super microscopic look at how replicators work. Yeah, it was awesome. And then we get the cool hollow mirror. Right, she can see her own reflection in mid-air without there actually being a literal mirror mounted on a wall. Yeah, that'd be so cool. That's a nice feature. <laughs> she is putting on her Starfleet uniform, which she never thought she'd do again since she was court-martialed, and Tilly comes in with a package for her. It seems that Burnham, she doesn't know what it is, so she puts her hand on it to open it, and the package voices, do you accept the last will and testament of Captain Georgiou? And without any hesitation, Michael takes the package, shoves it under her bed, and tries to forget about it. Yeah, yeah, she has this moment, and this this whole scene is also shows us something that's a little more subtle, that her and Tilly are getting closer, because Tilly walks in with this package saying, like, sorry, you were in the shower when we got the comms that we had mail, so I went to go get it, and she's having this long explanation and Michael just looks at her and says, Tilly? 
And Tilly's like, right, right. Uh, she says, right, less extraneous words. And she cuts to the chase. But this little scene shows us that Tilly and Michael have had some more interaction, even in that day, because this is one day after the last episode. And they're getting a little closer. I don't know if they're getting closer or Michael is just getting tired of Tilly's extraneous words. And I th- probably Tilly has some awareness of her own shortcomings. And now Michael is not afraid to express them. Possibly. I don't think she, maybe not, maybe not uh, anger at her, but anger at Tilly for doing it. But just like. I think case? exasperation. Is yeah, the word. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is not necessarily the indication of friendship. <laughs> true, true. But they're roommates. Gotta put up with each other. Ugh, roommates, I hate them so much. <laughs> so Burnham exits her quarters, goes in the turbo lift where she meets with Saru, and Saru is like, I was not aware of this change in the staffing of this ship. Why are you still here? And Burnham's like, well, your captain thought I'd be an asset. Yeah, and she's kind of surprised, like, you didn't know I was here? He's, he says, Lorca doesn't seek my counsel. Yeah, and this is the first time in this episode that we see the threat ganglia. Yeah, this is actually where they actually named even. Right, so now we finally know what they are and roughly what purpose they serve. Yeah, well, so we get this little interesting insight where, where Saru says that Lorca just doesn't even talk to his first officer about such things. Which, which is, is weird. Which is interesting, yeah. You always accept the counsel of your first officer. You may not yeah. execute it, but you always pursue it. Yeah. And we also see this, mo- this moment where Saru is still struggling with the fact that, well, I mean, even now that he discovers that she's here, but she just struggles with the fact that Michael did what she did on the Senzao because he's kind of like, doesn't want her nearby, which is a weird reaction. Because last episode, he was being all kind of like, kind of cordial and friendly. And this time she's kind of like, well, hey, why are you being so weird to me after you, what you just said? And he's like, well, if you would have asked me, I would have said we don't have an opening for a mutineer. I said you were valuable. But I thought you were going to leave the ship, so I was being nice and polite. Yeah. <laughs> so they in- uncomfortably ride up to the bridge together, and they find themselves under a Klingon attack. Now, did you r- figure out what was going on uh, here? Immediately, because the whole ship would have been on red alert. Right. The whole ship would have been on red alert. And also, the only place we see the attacking ships is on the view screen, whereas it seems to be a directorial habit that we get some space shots as well from an omnipotent viewer. Uh-huh. So we, we didn't see that. We only see the ships on the view screen. And when the ships win the attack and destroy the USS Discovery, Captain Lorca's like, congratulations, everybody's dead. Let's do this better <laughs> next time. Yeah, and, and Landry's like, sorry, we'll do better next time. And he's like, it would be hard to do worse. <laughs> Although I found it interesting that he was so focused on the military drills because this seems like it's supposed to be a science ship and they kind of mention that later like it's not a science ship anymore it it can't doesn't have that luxury yeah so you have this this scene introduces us to the idea Lorca is trying to turn these scientists into soldiers and that's touched on again later in the episode right and they're just not cut out for that so it's no surprise that they might not be up to snuff right right and after the simulation he's like Michael let's go Saru do another drill so we know they're keep training after the fact Right, but the reason Saru's running the next drill is because Lorca takes Burnham down to the trophy room we saw at the end of the previous episode. Yeah, I call it his. I wrote down in my notes Lorca's lair. <laughs> is who calls it that? I did. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we get in here. We see all these weapons and creatures and things that we saw in the la- end of the last episode, and now we actually get to see it. And it seems like the crew, at least some of the crew, is aware that it's here. But it must be in the bowels of the ship, because all the lights have to turn on to go to it. Right. This isn't, like, right off his quarters or anything. No, no. It seems to be and an unused deck. I got to see more of the more of the room than we did in the last episode, and I was looking around. There was not any familiar weaponry other than katanas. And he says in here he tries to learn about war, and he learns from the best. Right. So he's like Sun Tzu, try, who's already been quoted in this series. He's trying to learn everything he can about all his potential enemies and how to use those skills. He's basically like a Borg warlord. He's trying to assimilate as much Warcraft as he can from wherever he can. Right, right. And something apparently in the background that I didn't catch, I still didn't see it even when I was looking for it. Some people think they saw a Horta from, next, from the original series. Isn't that a race? Yeah, they think they saw a Horta in a, ca- in a cage, and then later in the episode it was gone. Weird. Isn't that the race from which we originates the line, Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. Yep, and then Spot going, pain! Interesting. I, d- I did not see that anywhere in Discovery. I must have missed it. Yeah, I can definitely see the scene that people are 
thinking about, but I'm just not sure it's a Horta, but something is up. But more important in a cage in that room is the creature that destroyed the innards of the USS Glenn, which was destroyed in the previous episode. It was beamed aboard, put in a cage, and now Burnham is being charged with figuring out how to weaponize it. That is the word that Lorca uses. I want you to weaponize anything that can cut through a ship's hull and can accept phaser set to kill without a flinch. Yeah, it's fascinating here. And I also forgot to mention last week that they told us to call it the Tardigrade. And then this week they name it the Tardigrade or <laughs> in the next scene they call it, they name it Ripper. Ripper, right, which is a ridiculous name. <laughs> so Burnham is stuck in this room trying to figure out how to do this thing. At the same time, Corvin 2 is under assault. This is the mining facility that produces 40% of Starfleet's dilithium. And if the Klingons destroy this facility, then Starfleet is going to be severely handicapped in their ability to traverse the galaxy. Yeah, and Corvin 2 is actually from another episode again. I forgot to look that up. Where do we find Corvin 2? The name Corvon was vaguely familiar in the background of my brain, but I had to look it up. And it was mentioned in TNG once as a industrialized planet who had basically ruined their planet. And so that kind of fits here with the mining facility. Ah, yes. I see it now in Memory Alpha. This was in the TNG episode New Ground. Oh, this is when Worf's son Alexander comes to live on the Enterprise. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is the scene where I start thinking that Discovery is not a rogue Section 31 ship because Captain Lorca receives a call from a Starfleet admiral. And granted, yeah. admirals can be in Section 31, but to have this level of transparency with somebody so high up, I mean, this is not a secret covert mission that they're about to embark on. Right. The Discovery is being sent to save Corvin 2, even though there is no other ship nearby. The nearest ship would take 84 hours to get to Corvin 2, and that ship is still closer than the Discovery. Right. And so like, having admirals be part of Section 31 is not out there, but yeah, I think this is more of a known thing now. So, But we'll still see. Like, Admiral Ross in Deep Space Nine was, had some toe in there as well. I think there are some admirals who are aware of Section 31, but in this case, if the Discovery saves Corvin 2... All of Starfleet is going to know about it, and they're all well, going to ask, how did that happen? And they can't say, no, no. We're, that kind of happens, though, later on. We'll get to that. But we discover Corvon's under attack, and then you got to get their discovery. You do your thing. And they're going to use their mycelium warp or whatever. Yeah, so Lorca goes down to engineering and says to Stamets, do you want to be remembered with the Wright brothers, Elon Musk and Zephram Cochran? Which I thought was very interesting context. Yeah, I like that a lot. And he says, I know we've never jumped this far, but we need to make this work. So figure out how to make it work. And Sam is like, well, I guess there are some things we could try. There's stuff we salvaged from the Glen, but we don't know how it works. So we can do our best. It said, <laughs> it's almost like we're missing a supercomputer that the Glen had, and we don't. Yeah, we've got all these parts from here. We don't know what it does, but it seems to do something. And so they go ahead and they make the jump. What do you think about the jump sequence? I think a good, a good share of us all had a collective, collective oh my god! <laughs> I was utterly baffled because we know that the saucer section is sort of like two concentric rings, almost like DS9, but suddenly they start spinning like a pizza cutter? Yeah, it's just like my Enterprise pizza cutter I have upstairs. <laughs> what What is the purpose of that? I mean, I, I realize that in some science fiction, rotating rings is how you generate artificial gravity. I don't think that's what's happening here. I don't either. I don't know if we need an understanding. I thought it was just cool. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's cool, but uh, this ship was not designed with this functionality oh, it in was. mind. No, it was. Lieutenant Stamets mentions that. Oh. At some point. These these ships were based on his designs. Oh, okay. So the Discovery yep. was made to be a mushroom warper. Yep. Oh, oh all right. Oh, that's the theory. Same, same with the Glen. And for some reason, the rotating disks are essential to that functionality. Yeah, it looks cool. I love the graphic. I love this. I loved it. I loved where they ended up. Well, then, while, while, they're, while they're doing the jump, the tardigrade responds. And this is where it leads into the rest of the episode, the science of the episode again. That's right. The Ripper gets a little agitated during the jump. Yeah. So they basically end up like within the gravitational pull of a sun. Yeah, yeah. Which is awesome, because they're being dragged down into the sun, kind of like we saw in Star Trek Into Darkness with the Enterprise being sucked into the Earth gravitational well. And it's just such a cool backdrop, because we basically see a silhouette of Discovery as it's falling into the sun. Fortunately, of course, they're able to pull out. Yeah, they almost seem to do it with ease, but it's because we don't, we could think that huge drama thing of, oh my god, oh my god, like, get us out of here. Okay, done. But it was really cool. I thought it was such an awesome scene. Yeah, it was cool. that, And then they were able to pull out. 
for yeah, Christ. And, Otherwise, and it'd be a short series. That's true. <laughs> yeah. In this, Stamets gets injured. He smashes his head into a console. And then we get to go see the medical bay. Ouch. So he has a badly broken, not just a nose, but even skull fractures. Yeah. Uh, I was like, holy crap. <laughs> and we get to see the, the shiny, bright, clean sick bay. But uh, we got to see the doctor. Yeah. Does the doctor have a name yet? Yeah, Dr. Culver. Oh, okay, cool. And he, you see him repairing this. He has some dialogue with uh, Stamets about... Well, Stamets is like... I don't know. Dr. Culver's like, uh, like another centimeter, and this would have shoved into your brain, whatever. And mm. Stamets is like, eh, that part's not important. It only affects memory and feelings. And, and, and Culver's like, yeah, because we wouldn't want you to experience an emotion. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell if Stamets was being sarcastic or not. I mean, does he really give that little value oh. to memory and emotion? He he was being sarcastic here, I think. So some people apparently, um, the gentleman who plays Stamets, Anthony Rapp, yeah, made some illusions that the doctor and he, his, this character might be a couple. Well, that's cool. So I don't know if this is true, but I was reading that scene, looking for that, and I can kind of see the lovers quarrel. Another reason for haters not to watch Discovery. That's right. And if it's they... not true, hey, it's cool. Before we leave, Lorca comes in, and he has this dialogue with Stamets, Lorca. Turns on the shipwide communications and starts playing audio from Corvan 2 of the people suffering to show everyone, especially Stamets, like, no, this is what we are out here for. And this is such a jerk move, but it gets the point across. Like, you are soldiers. Discovery is no longer a science vessel. It's a warship. So then at this point, we go back to Lorca's lounge. Burnham and, La- and Security Chief Landry are in the, the Lorca's lair. And... Burnham is trying to tell Landry, like, hey, this creature is not not violent in any way in its natural state. Like, we hear the dialogue with the computer saying, like, it seems to forage on vegetation. But then, uh, why why is it acting like this? Landry com- comes in here and is like, I don't want to hear that. Uh, Burnham says, a, apparently a Vulcan proverb, it can only be what it is, not what you want it to be. Telling Landry, like, you can't... Uh, weaponize this thing when it's not made to be a weapon and landry's like screw that i'm gonna try to sedate it i'm gonna try to shoot it and all hell breaks loose yeah it is ridiculous to me that landry who is the chief of security would take this unknown organism that she doesn't know how it's going to react to their own known sedation protocols and simply lower the force field without making sure that the thing is actually sedate first this thing jumps out and slaughters her Yes, so, so there's two things going on here. One, once it's sedated, all its vitals go very low. We see on the screen in the background, all its vitals go really low. She's looking at that. And then she turns out the force field and tries to shoot it. Just before she does that, though, she mentions, in response to the Vulcan proverb thing of it can only be what it is, she says, Lorca isn't interested in what you are. He's interested in what you can do. And that's when she goes and turns off the force field. So this tells me that the crew is scared the crap out of Lorca. Like, the, the, Lorca scares the crap out of them. And they're trying to just keep him happy. She even said, like, he's on the warpath. Yeah, and in the previous episode, we saw Landry say to Lorca, whatever you want, I will do. Which seems, a, I mean, technically that is supposed to be how the chain of command works, but the way she put it sounded a little bit too personal. Yeah, and so he's got, I mean, and he shows, like, he can be quite a <laughs> And it seems like this crew is scared of him. And they're just keep doing what they can to keep him happy. And I think that's why she did this. She went, she's been with him, serving with him much longer, and she put her life in danger because of it. That's why she did this. Between this and Next Generation, security officers do not have a good habit of living beyond one season. <laughs> this is also true, except for Worf. That's true, but he wasn't security at first. No, and then he died a couple times, but they brought him back to life. Worf died? Uh, in the multiple universes and all this weird oh, jazz. Oh, sure, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. So they need to make a second jump to try to get back to Corvin 2. The first one didn't work. And at this point, Burnham thinks she has a theory that due to the way Ripper reacted to the jump, maybe it has some sort of affinity for the spores. So she has Tilly bring some spores from engineering to the trophy room. When she brings the spores to Burnham in the first place... Burnham says, like, you went through a lot of trouble to get this, and I hope you don't get in trouble. Don't get in trouble because you stole this from engineering, because she wasn't supposed to do this. And Tilly mentions that she can't help those people on Corvin, too, but I can help you help them. Mm -hmm. And that was very sweet. And Tilly, again, is not very scared of this tardigrade. She looks a little nervous, but 
we see her again being brave in the face of danger, just like in the last episode, which is really cool. Yeah, she was part of the boarding party that went over to the Glen, and now she's present when Michael drops the force field on Ripper, and uh, she doesn't shy away. Yeah, I thought I mean, this is a great moment insight into her character here. Yeah, I like that. Once Burnham has these spores, she feeds them to Ripper. Yeah, it was like, oh, yeah, he was really sweet. And he even, or it, I guess, even puts like some of its mouth tendrils on Burnham in a very sweet manner. Yeah, this creature is not what I expected. We didn't get a good look at him in the previous episode because it was so dark on the other ship. But I thought it was going to be more like something from Resident Evil when instead it's more like a giant m- dust mite. Yeah, yeah. They even mentioned something like that in the episode where I mentioned uh, tardigrades and how microscopic they are. This thing is not all that scary. It seems to attack only in self-defense, which, of course, they had all their phasers ready to fire when they boarded the Glen. There's still the question of where this thing came from, but it sounds like it made its way onto the Glen in order to eat their preserved mushrooms, whereas the Discovery is growing their own. Yeah, it seems to be from... I'm, I'm just going to say subspace, even though it's spore space, maybe? Ah. Uh. It's spore space. Yeah, it seems to be from that, I think, is what they're alluding to, and it just appeared on the ship, because they even mentioned how the Glen had no uh, hull fractures or any way where it was obvious this thing broke into the ship. And so with Stamets' permission and approval and supervision, Michael beams this creature into the forest she broke into in the previous episode on the starship, and the Ripper starts basically communicating with the mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of a really cool little scene. We got to see uh, Stamens not be such a jerk to Burnham as well, and he's actually having a conversation with her, and kind of like surprise and wonder and investigating. That's really kind of nice, neat. Right, and that's how they deduce that Ripper might be the supercomputer that the Glen was using. So they beam it into the little cell area where the equipment that they got from the Glen is, and the the equipment and the Ripper start interacting, and it now has all the coordinates for all the places that they can warp to. Yeah, yeah, they're surprised, like, oh my god, I got this great map, but at the same time, they get they see this, they can set a course, they tell the captain, like, hey, we can get there, no problem now. We see Burnham looking at the tardigrade at Ripper, and seeing that this thing is in pain, as we go all equinox on it. Yeah, this thing does seem pretty uncomfortable doing what Discovery has it doing. So that, I guess, would explain to me why it was so angry on the Glen and why it broke out and killed so many people. I don't know how Discovery is going to stop that same thing from happening. I don't either. They have enslaved a conscious, if not sentient creature, basically to power their ship. Yeah. And slavery is not very Federation-like. No, it's not. And I think now we know why don't, they don't use this travel in future episodes, series. I hope that's why, but they do make it to Corvin 2 in order to fight the Klingon birds of prey that are still attacking the, the mining colony. And it seems to me that the birds of prey are engaged in atmospheric strafing runs as opposed to just pummeling the ship from orbit. Yeah, yeah. Why would they do that? I guess we don't know much about Klingon warfare. I know it's not... I think they've talked about doing this in the past. Or you have seen it in other shows. No, no, no. It was on Deep Space Nine. Yeah, no, no, no. They, they just do bombing runs because they have their tiny little ships do the raiding. Whether well, honor isn't involved, I don't know. They we're talking about a race that uses cloaking technology. Right. And sneaks up on the enemy and calls it honorable. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they're doing this. It's it seems very inefficient. But it does give the discovery another opportunity to appear in a planet's atmosphere and attack them directly. And I'm not really sure I understood the tactic. It looks like they waited until the birds of prey were in a certain position and then they mushroom warped out of the atmosphere and left behind photon torpedoes? Yeah, it's a little odd tactic, but they, um, yeah, that's exactly what they did. It looked like, or maybe not photons, but some kind of torpedo device or bomb device. I thought that was equally inefficient. It did seem a little weird, but maybe it's one way to take out a bunch at once. I suppose, but... But yeah, it did seem a little weird. But it worked! It worked! And and they beamed out, or they warped out, and then everyone came outside going, Hey, we're the Klingons! Who saved us? We don't know! So this is why maybe no one knows about this technology. Because they weren't in atmosphere long enough for the colonists to recognize, hey, that's the USS Discovery, NC-1031. Exactly. Maybe. Who knows? The colony gets saved. They figure out how to work the mushroom warper, which they're trying to use to defeat the Klingons, because they can warp into any place in known space in an instant. They can do all sorts of surprise attacks. Michael and Ripper are not as friendly as they were before, because Ripper now knows that he's being used. 
He's yeah, enslaved. She comes back with more spores and Ripper does not take them. And she apologizes to it. Whether it understands, I don't know. And there's also a gift waiting, not just for Ripper, but also for Michael. She finally goes back to her quarters and opens how the show opened with the last will and testament of Captain Georgiou. Tilly comes in and says, you should open it. You shouldn't be afraid. Because I've seen you. I saw you tame that thing. And you're not afraid of anything. Basically, she's the one who got Burnham to open the package in the first place. Yeah, she certainly admires Burnham, that's for sure. Yeah, and so I think... And I think we're seeing more and more why Tilly is a very popular character with people right now. She's she's really strong under these there under her nervous facade. Well, she I mean, it's not a facade, but under her nervousness, she is a very strong person. She is. It's true. And so I like her. Yeah, she opens it up, and I, I knew what was going to be in there, not just because what I was missing from before, but like okay, we get this sweet moment where Brandon is watching this video, hollow video of Captain Georgiou. Talking to her, saying like, oh, you're probably a captain now if you're seeing this. I want you to have this piece that's been in my family for centuries. And I'm proud of you as if you were my own daughter. And then we pan over the package and it's a telescope. Yeah, which I saw coming because she said, I have something to give to you that's been in my family for hundreds of years. And I'm like, well, that means it's old technology, so it must be a telescope. Uh Uh-huh. And that's what was missing in the Klingon scenes. In the ready room was a telescope. Yeah, and this drove home why it was so hard for Michael to open this package because she feels responsible for her captain's death. So why would she? She she doesn't feel deserving of receiving anything. She wants nothing. It's a form of self punishment. But in the end, she decides to honor her captain's wishes. And of course, the captain recorded this hollow video when she didn't realize how badly things would end between the two of them. So it's very bittersweet in that respect. Yeah, and she has this line that I suspect is going to be important. As Zhao Zhao does. And the best way to know yourself is to know others. The best way to take care of yourself is to take care of others. Oh, that's you. It actually says both things. Okay. Help yourself take care of others. Yeah, so well, I mean, I think Michael is a pretty selfless person already. She was trying to save Captain Georgiou all through the first two episodes. We'll see how her character evolves over time. So overall impression of this episode? I really, really, really liked it. I think there might... This is the one episode I had the most notes for. Yeah, I felt like... There wasn't the most... It had the least amount of subtlety in anything it was saying. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, no, it's neither. But I think I think this episode just put everything out there and there was nothing to hide. I think we are de- definitely getting a clearer view of Lorca and his motivations, for example. I think we see some of the internal battles that are going on within Michael and what she needs to overcome. I still am not clear on who is a good guy and who's a bad guy, who can be trusted and who cannot. There is a lot of internal conflict. It's a bunch of shades of gray. Not hey, like the hey, movie. Hey. <laughs> no. No, and not like the TNG episode. Stop. There's the, there'll never be anything that bad on Discovery. <laughs> no, there stop. won't be. No, stop. <laughs> I know we're getting a little long on the episode, but there's one final small point I wanted to point out. On the internet, okay, last week you asked, why does everyone blame Burnham for the war? Uh huh. The internet cannot agree either. Yeah, I engaged in a lengthy discussion in a Facebook group on that point, and the consensus was basically that she blames herself for the war. The rest of Starfleet, all they know is that a war happened and a mutiny happened at the same time, and so they have decided to correlate the two, whether or not it's justified. Yeah, but other than that, like, there's still there's no real huge consensus. It just seems to be the best answer. Right, the Klingons showed up wanting to wage war, Captain Georgiou handled the situation exactly the way she intended without any interference, ultimately, from Michael. And this is what happened. Yeah. Oh, well. I'm still keen to continue watching Discovery. I didn't mean to sound as tepid last week as I probably did. It's just that this is very different from any Star Trek we've seen before. And although it does seem quite dark, because it starts with a war, whereas it took Deep Space Nine several seasons to get to that point... There's still points of hope in the show as well, as you mentioned with Tilly. Yeah, there's hope, and we also get to see the science aspects, too, just like other series. It's not not the focal point of every episode, but we still get to see it. We get to see Burnham doing research. We get to see people coming to conclusions doing the science. Right, although we do get to see Michael in every episode because she's the main character. I don't know how much we're going to get to see the other characters except as foils for her. Right, right. They're, we're all seeing things from her point of view for the most part. Right, so that is something that's relatively new for Star Trek. Mm-hmm. I mean, individual episodes will have main characters like Data's Day, of course, but to have the same main character throughout the entire series, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Especially, yeah, because like, usually we're used to seeing like everything that 
the captain knows we usually know unless it's right. kind of a subplot and it's time like no we don't and it's it's an interesting point of view. I like it. Cool. So, uh, should we keep going then? Should we do another episode of Transporter Locket and I watch another episode of Discovery? We absolutely should. I agree. We went into all this work for setting up the show. Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, in that case, I think we should tune in again this coming Sunday for the next episode. Do you watch the teasers about next week not. on Discovery? Neither I do, do I. Not. Right, Neither no. do I. I already intentionally go knowing as little as possible into each episode. I don't want to see the spoilers. I saw one person mention something that happened in the teaser like oh it doesn't ruin anything but it just annoyed me but this also means that i basically never see the end credits yeah same here like i have no idea what the end credit music is like i guess i could fast forward selectively but i just haven't done it yet yeah cool all right Brie. well in that case i will talk to you next week see you next week if you've enjoyed this episode please leave a review on itunes and keep your hailing frequencies open by following us on twitter at transporter lock or subscribing to our podcast and email newsletter at transporterlock.com <laughs>